Surprise, Simply Trade listeners. Every Sunday, we're going to spice things up with a shot of adrenaline pumping news. We know you come to Simply Trade for top-notch education and insight and knowledge straight from trade professionals, but let's face it, the world never stops spinning and things happen every week that affect our daily lives. So we're bringing you the biggest stories in the trade world, served up fresh and hot with a side of entertainment from your favorite hosts, Andy and Lalo. I'm Anik and I'll be moderating this news show. So let's get it all started. Hi, Simply Trade listeners. We are back for another news episode. Very exciting. I hope you enjoyed the last one. If you haven't checked it out, go check it out. And all of our other episodes, of course, you don't want to miss any. So today we're bringing you three more articles that we're going to talk about. I would think they're a little bit more entertaining than the other three, but might just be my opinion. So let's get straight into it. So the first one is kind of something that actually affects me or, I mean, many other people, millions probably. And it's um, a phishing scam that's been going on with um, some brands such as DHL, FedEx, USPS, you know, where we receive our packages from. And, you know, I'm not sure if anyone deals with that, but you know how you get those emails and they're kind of weird and they tell you to click a link and your package is here or you have to... I don't know. You have to do all this stuff. Well, it's a phishing scam. And this is what the article is kind of talking about. And we want to go in what these companies can do to maybe secure it. Or I actually don't even know, understand it, what they can do to kind of fix this problem. So let's talk more about it. I'm excited to hear from Lalo and Andy. So let's get straight into it. Let's let our tech guy go with it first, because I can give oh, you my no, comments no. from a layman <laughs> well, I'll, perspective. I'll give you, but. I'll give you my my end of the my perspective of this. It's not so much uh, what DHL or FedEx or the express carriers can do about it. It's more about what companies who are getting these phishing scams uh, need to do about it. Not 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 do about it, but need to do about it is. Um, with uh, cybersecurity and all these uh, concerns with with supply chain security, and you you need to have. And again, we've talked about this in many episodes, Andy, um, about getting trade compliance into the mix of the whole corporate decision, and 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 uh, not just being a um, the no person and all this and that, right? I mean, um, trade compliance. I I guess because obviously because we are a trade compliance um, related. Um, uh, podcast, I, I want to talk about that aspect and saying that that trade compliance person should be saying, look, listen, guys, if we have a breach in our security, it, be it cybersecurity in this case, because this is a phishing scam, um, it's going to really screw up our, our supply chains, it could it could slow them down, etc. That's the way I saw it. I mean, I, I mean, and again, last week, we talked about CTPAD, and I hate to bring it up again. But best practices in CTPAD are make sure you have IT um, airtight or as good as airtight um, security. So something like this doesn't happen. I know of several companies, they go and do fake phishing, you know, like the IT department will go and send out a fake uh, phishing scam just to see who opens it. And then they make them, they put them in uh in cybersecurity jail, <laughs> you know, they have to go through training, et cetera. <laughs> what? I've never oh, no, heard yeah. of that. Oh, yeah. That oh, yeah. yeah. You're, 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 you're isolated. <laughs> kind of hilarious. Yes. Yeah. They make, well, they actually, make you, it's, it's like a placebo. Yeah. No, they make you, yeah. they make you take classes on cybersecurity. Well, I, I will say this. I've uh, been in uh, some companies where people have clicked on the links and here's the deal. To your point and what's in the article is that something to come across, hey, we've been, you know, we need to reach you or talk to you about your uh, a package we're trying to deliver. It comes across as if it's from a UPS, DHL, FedEx, USPS or whatever. Um, it could come across as, you know, that's just one example that could come across as, you know, attached as your invoice for whatever, please, you know, process for payment and, you know, and you got to, you'll click on something or what appears to be a PDF and you click on it and it actually has an embedded, uh, uh, something in there, you know, virus to whatever else. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. 
And also, I mean, this is from a marketing perspective. I think these companies, if they know some something like this is happening, while we see it on the news, which is great, I think these these companies can do a lot of marketing and say, you know what, if you see this, don't click on it. Like kind of inform your um, your customers in that way. Well, and the thing is, remember though. Just a though, little bit. This could be a side thing. Yeah, but remember, it's, it's also something, Manic, that – you don't know when they're sending it. And so they're not going to, they may be trying to use it. And, and all the, the three big ones I just mentioned are really protective of their brand. So I think this is a scenario, a lot of this happened, but still you've got to be smart. And uh, so be weary of something like that. So in a sense, fishing, whether it's, they use the guise of a trying to track and trace a package or something like that, or it's something else, or whatever. It all is from a standpoint of getting that email into your inbox. You click on it. Now you're on the inside of the system, and it's going to get you. Yeah. Yeah, it's a very – I mean, it's a continuous problem, and it's been a problem. So let's hope that this will be something that will not um, be continuing in the future. So, yeah, that's for this one. Um, great insights. Things that I had not heard before. But the second one is even, I mean, this one I really connected with. It was um, the Tesla's new manufacturing plant in Mexico. We had an electric car um, or electric battery, whatever, last week. And now we're here talking about Tesla. So what about this manufacturing plant in Mexico? What I got is they're wanting to reduce manufacturing costs. Who doesn't obviously want to sell the cheapest product, right, to whoever? That's what I got. And it's a co- pro-corporate union decision that was made. Um, I wonder how that affects Tesla's image or if it does. And really, what are the motives? What are you guys' perspectives on that? <laughs> you want me to take that one initially, or well, you can start, uh, Andy. But I, 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 I kind of have a s- strong objection to how it was written. It was seemed a little biased to me, the the article, because um, personally, being so close to the border, number one and number two, having worked in Mexico and selling software out there for trade compliance, no less, um, for twenty. 20- Four twenty-five 25 years. So I have a different perspective of it, but go ahead, Andy. And then I'll, I'll I can probably wrap well, up. Uh-huh. Bef- before we go, since you said it was bias, I just want to say that this article came from NACLA.org. So okay. just, <laughs> just for reference. Okay. Now go ahead. Okay. Well, as far as Tesla setting up a plant in, in Mexico, a couple things going on. One, is for Tesla you know, being an auto manufacturer, uh, taking advantage of the U.S. MCA or NAFTA 2.0. It's the U.S. Mexico Canadian Trade Agreement. With that, the there are some strong positives with that. So you know, labor rates are going to be lower probably in in Mexico than they are in in Canada or U.S. However, with the U.S. MCA specific to automotive, there are labor rates at a bare minimum that they have to adhere to um, in the manufacturing of that. So that's one thing as far as, yeah, it's still probably, you know, lower manufacturing rates. There's also probably, though, a lower transportation rate, though. That's something to give thought to. Where are these vehicles going to be delivered to? Uh, The market's going to be in North America. So your transportation rates, if they are manufacturing those, you know, China is a huge, there's a huge Tesla plant over there and, and all that. Well, rather than importing those in, they're going to be, you know, right down the road, if you will, from in Mexico. So I think transportation rates will be lower. The labor rates will be decent. And third, it will, with to qualify for USMCA, you have to have, it went from 60% up to 75% of the raw goods have to be North American content. So you're looking at not only Tesla, but then supporting vendors that in North America that are going to be providing things for this. So I'm, hey, I'm all for this. I think it's going to be great. Yeah. yeah and I agree with that. Um, Part of the um, objections that I had to the article, again, it seemed a little biased to me only, again, 
I'm of course I'm Mexican and or not Mexican. I'm of Mexican descent. I'm, I'm actually American, but anyway, of of Mexican descent and and having uh, been in uh, in Mexico, like I said, working a lot there. I mean, personally, I I've seen it firsthand. People in Mexico are incredibly hard workers, so they have really good um, skilled labor. They have skilled labor. Um, they're not going to put out like a you know, like just a bad car or anything, but bad quality, first of all. Secondly, I've seen it where, for example, and I'm, and I'm going to use this as an example, um, the, the aerospace in, uh, the aerospace uh, industry, back when I was um, selling software, like let's say 10, 12, 13 years ago, uh, were starting to move into Mexico and they've created an incredibly high tech um advanced aerospace um, programs in Mexico where the local universities are even adapting those curriculums so that they can punch out these amazing engineers out there. So it's not just a a, 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 a theme of, yeah, I'm going to put my cars over there and they're going to assemble them and uh, haha, I'm taking advantage of their labor rates. Uh, number or Like you said, Andy, number one, they can't because of USMCA. There's a minimum labor uh, cost requirement for it to have uh, qualified for that. Secondly, um, they, I'm willing to bet by doing this, there's going to be a lot of um, people or engineers um, coming out of the local universities that are going to learn and know like LIDAR, you know, um, uh, sonar, I mean, all this self-driving and sensing stuff, um, battery, we talked about this last week, EV, battery technology, all, they, and they're going to be some of the most well-trained people like they are in the aerospace, en- uh, and, and I keep on trying to say aerospace engineering, aerospace industry. Um, that's just my opinion, again, only from what I've seen personally. So it's not all bad. I mean, I, I, I as bad as I thought I felt, I heard it on the article. Um, but you know, and as far as trade is concerned, I mean, it's good for the trade industry. I mean, they, these are going to be very likely because they're being manufactured in Monterrey. That's that's where the Giga plant is going to be. In. Which Monterrey, for those that uh, may uh, uh, not be aware, it's roughly a two and a half hour drive from the border, isn't it? Right. From Laredo, from Laredo, Texas. And it's considered the most industrial city in Mexico. Um, it is... Um, their Monterrey uh, Tech, uh, their techno, uh, Tecnológico de Monterrey, is considered like the MIT of of Mexico. Um, I'm telling you, I've, I've I've spent a lot of time in Monterrey. I mean, uh, industrial technology. W- there was a big IBM facility there. That that's where that's who I used to be partners with. So, et cetera. You know, what I mean, and besides going into much more into it, I just feel like you said, Andy, it's a good thing. Yeah. See, I was, I mean, when I heard that, I thought it was awesome at first. And that was my own perspective because obviously I, El Paso is very close to Mexico. So it, it just seemed great. But then I read the article and I was like, huh, this is a total negative spin on everything. So that's how much the news can affect you or reading just one article. I'm sure there's others out there that have a positive spin on it. I mean, we're posting this on LinkedIn as well. So comment under what you think, what your views are, because I would love to hear because obviously there's a lot of different standpoints, standpoints. Sorry about that. So moving on, we have, we're keeping, we're on the roll with Mexico lately. Um, so this is a good, this is a positive article, actually. Um, yeah, it is. Mexico bans importation of goods produced with forced labor. Yeah, well, what happened, it was it was enforced or it was not enforced. I'm sorry. It was ratified uh, three months. Okay, May 18, it's coming into uh, in effect. But it was 90 days before that. So it was published. Um, but why did it, why did this decision take so, I mean, take so long? What, what takes countries so long? Now, some of that you have to have so many days, you know, 90 days, 180 days or whatever from, you know, you're, you're vetting the legislation. Uh, you're, you're open for comments. They go through all that. They refine it. It gets passed. Then you still have a given time frame for things going on. So, yeah, I mean, governments move about as fast as molasses on a winter day, but you know, it is moving. I know. I mean, I'm glad they did it. So we're here now. This is great. 
what are the next steps for Mexico? So obviously, do you have to weed out some Im importers? And and I'm, I bet Andy's going to is probably thinking this. I don't know, but we've had several people talk about forced labor. But so here it is: a lot of companies, knowingly or not, inadvertently or 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 on purpose, I guess any way you want to put it. Um, bring in products from Mexico to bypass the fact that they're Chinese. One good example is Chinese cotton, for example, that, that they, that it's, that it, that it, that it's weaker cotton. Okay. So that's obviously banned from, from being imported, but they bring it into Mexico, produce something off of it and bring it into the U S hoping that it's not going to be. Well, in the, in, in the article in, or in the, well, in the article, as well as in the new rules, it says, all right, in general, the new rules provide a blanket prohibition on imports into Mexico of goods produced in whole or part with forced labor. It goes on. So the, the point being is that what's happening and what has happened is literally the very thing, the, the example we just mentioned that Lalo and I were talking about. There was a Uyghur raised or, or cotton raised by in the Uyghur region. Let's put it that way which was forced labor, that's the northwest quadrant of China, was sent down to, to Mexico. They manufactured a, a bunch of shirts. They literally came across the border. Customs, now the country of origin on that said Mexico, or can, country of manufacture, whatever. And then uh, customs in the, in the U.S. CBP uh, took samples and literally tested the cotton and found it was cotton from the Uyghur region and rejected the whole thing. So what this kind of legislation now is doing in Mexico is dealing with that to help cut that off at the source. So this is going to be another positive in an anti-slavery. When we're saying forced labor, it's you're talking the slavery. So anti-slavery type deal. So I think this is a very strong positive and uh, it's just another thing where is a trade ally, Mexico and U.S. are aligning their efforts so that our goods are not fighting each other in, in this row. That, I mean, this is awesome. This is an awesome way to kind of wrap up our news episode. Um, I have a quick fact that I'm going to uh, keep adding now. I'm going to find some fun facts. Not sure if you guys drink boba tea. I do love boba tea. They're good. People are like weird about the texture, but boba tea is the top food imported from Taiwan. And it's a Gen Z yeah, thing, okay. but it started, it got more popular in the pandemic. And so they call it a pandemic era success. So there you go. That's our last fact of the episode. This was far too long, but you know what? We had lots of good things to talk about. So um, this is very interesting. And I hope you guys had fun listening to us and got some new knowledge because I'm sure I did. And uh, yeah, if you have any questions, comments, um, write them to us, find us on LinkedIn, find us anywhere and, you know, like, comment and subscribe. Of course, we're on all podcasts. And so let's wrap it up and we hope to see you next week. Happy Easter if you do celebrate. Bye, guys. See you next week. Simply Trade is not a law firm or an advisor. The topics and discussions conducted by Simply Trade hosts and guests should not be considered and is not intended to substitute legal advice. You should seek appropriate counsel for your own situation. These conversations and information are directed towards listeners in the United States for informational, educational, and entertainment purposes only and should not be substituted for legal advice. No listener or viewer of this podcast should act or refrain from acting on the basis of information on this podcast without first seeking legal advice from counsel. Information on this podcast may not be up to date depending on the time of publishing and the time of viewership. The content of this posting is provided as is. No representations are made that the content is error free. The views expressed in or through this podcast are those of the individual speakers, not those of their respective employers or Global Training Center as a whole. All liability with respect to actions taken or not taken based on the contents of this podcast are hereby expressly disclaimed. Hey.